Which defender could break out for the Auburn Tigers? And what does Auburn baseball need to do to defeat Ole Miss and Omaha? We have all the answers on today's Locked on Auburn. Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm. And I'm, I'm freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked on Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. It's Friday. Normally, um, we have Justin Ferguson joining us, but scheduling would not make that a lot. And also, uh, there's this thing called Omaha happening, and we, we got to bring in our resident Auburn baseball expert to talk about that. Later in the show, Lindsey Crosby of Auburn Daily and host of Locked On MLB Prospects, and we will get into Omaha, Lindsey. But first things first, we put out the results to a poll of uh, th- that we sent the link out to you several weeks ago, all of the audience members of this, and we asked the question, who do you believe can break out for the Auburn Tigers on defense this year? Got a ton of different answers. And we'll go into who you guys said in just a moment. But, Lindsey, just shooting from the hip, who is your breakout defender for this team in 2022? So, trying to figure out who that was going to be was hard for me because I don't really know what the definition of a breakout is. The first thing I thought of when I saw this poll is I was like, well, Derek Hall's not going to be in there. He's already broken out. Right. And then so the first place I went for defender was, well, Equiliota. He's going to be the breakout guy. And – I think I'm not quite sure what defines a breakout. Yeah, what is a breakout in the in the context of Eculiota? I mean, you look at him last year, he was second on the team in sacks. Derek Hall had nine, and we've all praised how impressive his season was last year. Ecu had seven. And so it, if he jumps from seven to 10, is he breaking out? Or is he just taking that next step? I think there's a difference. And... If I remember correctly, Eculiota wasn't even a starter for the entire season. So mm-hmm. it's kind of easy to project out and say, yeah, he, he got seven with two-thirds of the starts or you know three-fourths of the starts. He would have gotten to nine on a full slate for the most part. So what, yeah. makes, what makes it a breakout? Does he have to get to double digits? Is it something where because he's a defensive lineman, we have to look at uh, the P, the the PFF grading and all the stuff because there's things they do that doesn't show up on the stat sheet. Sure. So it's like, how do we define a breakout when it comes to a defensive lineman who was second on the team in t- in, in sacks? No, that, so, that that's a good one. That's a good one. So are you saying Eku? Are you saying you considered Eku? I considered Eku, and I I'm de- I'm kind of defaulting to that because I just don't necessarily know where to go with this. Uh, I do. I thought about Donovan Kaufman. I Good thought one. another year in this defense, uh, but at the same time, I feel like he had a really good, a, a pretty good year last year as well. And so, how do you define a breakout for a guy who started just about the entire season? That's that's the problem I had here. I'm not thinking enough about the youth in this mm-hmm. defense. Yeah, Donovan Kaufman transferred after spring. Uh, he was waiting for all the the rules to pass and to, to become official, where he'd be able to transfer right away last season. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously he had an impact last year, but he could really take a huge step. I think he's now, instead of playing catch up, I think he's going into it as a leader of this defense. And we talked to him on the show during spring and I'm sure everything's slowing down for him a little bit. So Donovan Kaufman is an outstanding one. Mine's Jalen Simpson. Um, and I talked about him a little bit earlier in the week when Mike G came on and we were talking about guys that are flying under the radar. I think Jalen Simpson is primed to have, a really, really good year for this defense. And I think with what Auburn has up front, opposing offenses are going to want to pass it. I think, one, that'll be the the, the perceived weakness of this defense is to pass a game as it was last year. And then also, I think just college offenses are throwing it more. And when Auburn plays Mississippi State and Ole Miss – and Alabama every year, it's like, yeah, okay, they're going to play against teams that, that want to throw the football. So I, I think that makes a ton of sense there. And so I think Jalen Simpson is going to be on the field. Even if he is not a starting corner, even if it's James, the transfer from Oregon, 
even if it's Nehemiah Pritchett, which I think all three of those guys are going to be good, all three corners, there's going to be situations where all three of those guys are on the field at the same time. I think. I certainly think so. Because I, I think both Nehemiah and James and, and Simpson, I think they're all able to play inside corner as well. And so it's going to be fun to see what they do with Kaufman. Is Kaufman the primary nickel? Because I would think they feel better about the cornerback position than they do the safety position. So keep Donovan Kaufman at safety next to Zion Puckett or Craig McDonald and then put more corners on the field. To me, to me, I think that makes more sense when I look at what the roster is looking like right now. Yeah, and in modern college football now, your third cornerback is a starter. I mean, you're sure. you're not in base that much in the SEC in 2021-2022. So, yeah, those three guys, James, Simpson, Pritchett, all at the same time. I do also like the idea of Kaufman being at safety more uh, simply because yeah. I think it, it, it mitigates some of, the, some of the talk you hear about weaknesses. But really, it's just being a little more experienced in this scheme. It gives him the ability to, to, to sit back and see everything, be able to diagnose and make a play. He's not having to play as instinctual because he's trying to catch up and speed up with the, with the defense. He understands more of it. He can be, he's behind everybody so he can get folks lined up as well as he can kind of watch and patrol and uh, take care of mistakes, be the eraser, if you will. No, I, I love that. I love that. Donovan Kaufman, the eraser. I think that's a lot of fun. All right. Who did you guys say? I think you guys have some interesting names up there and we will share that. In just a moment, today's show is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Bet Online is really involved with the College World Series, obviously starting today. Auburn starting tomorrow, and we'll jump more into that conversation about what Auburn needs to do to feed Old Miss coming up. But Bet Online has everything, as well as NBA final stuff, NHL final stuff. This is a fun time of year. For sports and it can be even better if you check our friends out at bet online so bet online where the game starts all right Lindsay, we put this out and um had a good amount of votes here is what you uh what you guys said in the audience here the locked on power poll who will break out on defense in 2022 and if you're watching on youtube you can see it and uh, for podcasting Eculiota and jeffrey emba they both tied with 22.2 percent of the vote Cam Riley came in third, of course, the linebacker. Jalen Simpson, that's who I voted for um, with 12.7% of the vote. Wesley Steiner at 9.5%. And then Nehemiah Pritchett, 4.8%. So all these guys, with the exception of Jeffrey Emba, are guys that we've kind of mentioned uh, throughout this week already, Lindsay. About that list, who stands out to you the most? Number one to me is Jeffrey Emba. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something where I'm not surprised that he's on the list. Okay. I mean, Jeffrey Emba is a, a very large human being. We've heard lots of great things about him. Sure. Uh, what I am surprised about is that he tied Ekuliota for tops in the poll. And right. I think the reason I'm surprised is because I didn't think anybody would pass Leota because Leota is more of a known quantity. He started for two thirds of the year last year. But, but yeah. to me, though, the, if any kind of known quantity makes it less of a breakout contender in my mind, because we already kind of know what they are. When I think of a breakout player, I'm thinking about a guy that was a role player at best or just not on the roster, and then they come out the following season and become a really, really valuable part of the defense. Eku's already been valuable. And so for the folks that voted for Eku, I love Eku Leota. Absolute Unit. unit. Um, can't stress that enough. But I just don't see him as a breakout candidate because I think he's already there. I think he's already good. Because like, if Eculiota comes out and just gets, let's say he matches his production from last year, Lindsay, seven sacks, which is a really solid season for a pass rusher. We're disappointed, right? Yeah. If Ecu only gets seven sacks next year, assuming he doesn't get hurt or anything, we're disappointed if he just gets seven sacks. If he plays, plays 12 games with seven sacks, that's not a good thing for Auburn's defense. Yeah, we're, we're, we're bummed. And, and obviously there's other stats, you know, is he getting pressures and things like that. But just if he had the same exact season he had this year, we're disappointed. And to me, I, I just don't think that could be a breakout player. Now, Jeffrey Embaugh, 
we don't know anything about this guy other than he's got the nickname Thanos. His junior college tape is stupid. Like, it is absolutely ridiculous what he did to opposing offensive linemen. Um, and he's massive, and he moves really well. Um, but, like, he didn't participate in spring due to injury. It just kind of uh, seems like he's ready to go for the fall. But that that's a breakout candidate. I'm totally fine with that. That's not the first person that comes to my mind. But yeah. just in, in YouTube comments, I mean, people are always asking us, what about Jeffrey Imba? What about Jeffrey Imba? So, I mean, I believe it. I believe that a big chunk of the fan base is really, really excited about this guy. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking about it more from that perspective of the role player who's stepping up versus the guy that we literally have never seen yeah. on the field at Auburn, uh, and we're expecting him to do big things from that. So I guess it's just like part of it's a perspective thing for me, and that's no probably question. why they tied is there's a bunch of folks who think like you, well, Eku's not a valid candidate for the poll because he's already, for the most part, broken out. He's a mostly a full-time starter now. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the linebacker thing to me, I was also, I was curious about that as well because I've had so much trouble myself trying to figure out who's going to get more of those number two snaps next to Owen Papa. Is it going to be Wesley Steiner or is it going to be Cam Riley? Right. And I, I feel like they're not quite interchangeable, but that they've both shown that they can do it. And it's just a question of who's going to be the first guy on the field in week one. And I feel like I don't know that. Apparently, the people think that Cam Riley, some way or another, is going to force the issue. And I think we saw that a little bit in spring. I think Cam Riley seemed to generate more buzz than Wesley Steiner, I think. Uh, and this is just from, you know, outside looking in type stuff. But their skill sets, I mean, Cam Riley is massive. And we talked about him, you know, doing reps at edge uh, early in the spring. You know, can he rush the passer? His size certainly allows you to think he could be a thumper and play close to the line of scrimmage. Wesley Steiner is more, I think, rangy and more like Owen Papo as far as just freak athlete. Um, so to me, that screams more passing situation type of guy, unless you're rushing Cam Riley. Um, it seems like Steiner is more of a fit in pass coverage. So that's probably a strength, right, Lindsay, that they're not the same player. I think yeah. that's encouraging that they're not interchangeable. And the fact of like, okay, you've got, if you're a defensive coordinator, if you're Jeff Schmetting and you're like, man, I've got, I've got more tools to play with. The, the, the point I didn't want to make, but that kind of, you made the comparison there. Wesley Steiner also kind of feels like he's your Owen Papo insurance. If for some reason Papo gets injured again, or doesn't heal correctly from this same thing, he's still working on. Yeah. You've got Wesley Steiner who, has a lot of those similar traits that you can slot into that Owen Papo role that he plays, and you can have those two guys on the field together. So there is that as well. And I, you hate to voice something like that. You don't want to to will it into existence, but that is a that is a thought process that I have to go through there because of just the last nine months for Owen Papo and and some of the struggles he's had with being healthy. Yeah, of course we're all rooting for him, but it, it's something it's something that you've got to mention. No, uh, I I think that's great um, as, as far as you know, your, your perspective on all of this. And I've kind of been the same way, like with Austin Troxel, you know, just talking about his injuries time and time again, the date back to high school. Um, I think if he would have never gotten hurt and could stay healthy, like he's probably a really good offensive tackle at this point, but it's just, I mean, when you get hurt, you take a step back as part of it. Um, other guys that should have been in this top five or six or however many were on there. Um, Craig McDonald should be on there. I know he was good at Iowa state, but I think he's going to be really, really good for Auburn this year. The transfer, safety i think that's a guy that you got to think about and then i'm a little surprised that another another transfer name wasn't on there uh just because the fans love jason jones right now i'm seeing jason jones on all kinds of lists and uh, I, i'm a little surprised that the, the listeners didn't didn't vote jason jones up there yeah i could see uh, you know he was one of the the he was part of that bo nicks trade and so you know folks were yeah. Excited to have him in, and then he's not listed in here. Um, I guess I kind of had unrealistic unrealistic expectations for Eugene Asante and the kind of the role that he would be able to take in year one on this are roster. You, are you high on him, too? I can't find anyone else that's high on him. Do you like him? I like what he could be. Same, and yeah. I guess it's just something where you've got these guys who have been backups for a couple seasons now and they understand the defense. And so you're not counting on much from him in year one, mm -hmm. but he's going to be a key backup for you 
this year and then be able to compete for a role his senior year. I guess that's what we're looking at with this. But I mean, I, I like everything I've seen from him, but I guess the timing of when he got here too kind of means that's why we haven't heard a lot of him uh, on these lists and things like this yet. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he was the rotational linebacker with Owen Papo not being in spring. And so it's like, we've seen in the past where we felt good about a fourth linebacker, which I guess last year was Cam Riley. And it's just like, when everybody was healthy, we just, I don't think we would have seen Cam Riley hardly at all. And so is the rotation going to be that drastically different just because this is a Kobe McLean and Chandler Wooten are gone? And I don't think so. I, I would almost think it'd be more of an excuse to put guys on the field with them. So, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what the linebacker position does. I'm trying to think if there's any other. We've hit the defensive backs pretty good. I'm trying to think if there's any other guys on the line of scrimmage that I think could potentially break out. And, and none are really coming to mind just because I think it's just so set, right? I mean, Eku, Derek Hall, Wooden. I mean, there's just, they're just set. Yeah, there's not um, many think, spots for a young guy to step in and, and contribute. You've heard good things about like an NC sledge, but like where is he, who's, whose snaps are, is he going to take? Exactly. Yeah. And then like a Marquise Burks, you know, I think there's something to like there, but I think what we, I, I think he is what he is. You know, I, I, I don't really see him taking a huge step forward. I think what he is is valuable, but I, I just don't see that, that huge step forward. Oh, wait. We have a we have a comment on our Instagram page when we ask this question <laughs> from Marcus Harris, and Marcus Harris's answer was Marcus Harris. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love a man's willing to bet on himself. I love it, man. I love it. He votes in all of our polls. He uh he, he's starting to comment more and more. I love it. I think it's awesome. Listen, he's putting it out there where everybody can see it. The people want Marcus Harris on the podcast. What's manif I'm manifesting this. Yeah, just be like, so who do you think the best defensive player is? Oh, Marcus Harris. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If a defensive lineman had to move to corner, who would it be? Marcus Harris. Okay, got it. I, it it's who Jackson the best Kelly. Transfer of the Brian Harson era. Oh, Marcus Harris. Marcus Harris. Okay, got it. Got it. I think that's what that podcast would be, and I would. I'm totally here for it. Just, just set him up with a bunch of softballs and let him crush them. Set him up with a bunch of quarterbacks and let him, and let him just sack them. Boom, 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 done. Yeah, best transfer in Auburn history from Kansas. Marcus Harris. Okay, got it. Got it. So, all right, in just a moment, <laughs> Lindsey's going to tell us what Auburn needs to do to beat Ole Miss tomorrow in Omaha. The College World Series. You don't want to miss that. Stay tuned right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at Rock Auto with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models. It's now impossible for your uh, local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure the often pointless, intimidating questioning? Is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And wait for the person behind the counter to order parts from their computer, choosing only the brands that their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers or smartphones with access to rockauto.com at home or in your pocket. Take advantage of it. We have great technology to make our lives easier and things more cost-effective, and rockauto.com can help you do that. So save time and money when using rockauto.com. And look, Rock Auto is a family business, serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car, truck, or SUV. And right, Locked on Auburn, in their How Did You Hear About Us box, so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need. That is at rockauto.com. Lindsey Crosby, the Auburn Tigers are in the College World Series. They take on Ole Miss tomorrow, 6 o'clock Central Time. Since we last talked on the podcast, they have announced that Joseph Gonzalez will be the starter, which I think is the right move. I think you do as well. Mm -hmm. um, what does this mean? What does this mean for Auburn? So... This means, one, Auburn is cognizant that we need to get our best guy on the bump immediately. But what I love about Joseph Gonzalez going in game one is he missed the Ole Miss series. Yeah. Butch talked about this before the team left for Omaha, right. about how you're not the same team that you were when you played these other teams. Because we've played over half the field. We played Oklahoma in week one. 
We've right. played Texas A&M. We've played Ole Miss. We've played Arkansas. Uh, but there are things you can take from those games. And something that they can't take from that game is hitting a Joseph Gonzalez sinker. They did not face him this year. Last year, when I went back and pulled the numbers, Joseph Gonzalez threw an inning and a third in relief against Old Miss, gave up one hit and one run uh, in that. And so they haven't really seen him. So I like the strategic advantage there. Sure. Uh, and then on offense, you have to be disciplined. So Old Miss has churned through pitchers this year. They've had tons of injuries to the rotation. The three starters from the Old Miss series where they won two out of three in Auburn while they were ranked number one, none of those three guys are in their starting rotation for this weekend. Right. I mean, totally different teams from, from both sides of it. People forget Ole Miss was number one in the country when Auburn played them. They eventually just fell out of the rankings. I mean, both of these teams have been through a journey to get to where they are now. Ole Miss kind of started with high perception and dropped, and then they had to re-earn it. Auburn had to fight for it all season after constantly being doubted. Um, so, I mean, these teams are battle tested. These yeah. teams are, are, are ready for this. And Ole Miss went from number one in the country early in the season to one of the final four teams in the field of 64. Yeah. And then they've been absolutely scorching hot. They're one of two teams that has not lost a game in the postseason. Uh, they went through the Coral Gables regional as a number three seed plus 20 run differential. They went to Southern Miss on the road for the Super Regional in Hattiesburg, shut them out, did not let them score in two straight games. Um, Who's the other one? That's undefeated oh, in post, uh, postseason play. Oh, um, it is. It's in my preview on AuburnDaily.com where I go through the whole field. Right. But I believe... I edited it, that one. I didn't read it. I it is read it. Texas A&M. Texas A&M is also 5-0 in the postseason. Got it. Got it. Yeah. They, they really gelled too. But no, so Dylan DeLucia is the starter on Saturday. Converted reliever. Um, he was actually an incoming transfer out of junior college. But the thing here, 6-2, and two, 435 ERA. But um, he's, he's the starter not because his stuff is the best. He has two good pitches. He's got a fastball. He's got uh, that. I'll get to that in a second. He's got a, a, a good curveball. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's one of those really big breaking curveballs comes really deep in the zone. Uh, it's a plus pitch, and it's it's. I mean, he's starting to be on draft boards now with how that curveball has looked this year. Okay. But Auburn hitters need to be patient because the fastball is what um, prospect evaluators and talent evaluators call a dead zone fastball. So okay. he sits low nineties. He sometimes can hit ninety four with it. But by dead zone, we mean that when he throws it low in the zone. It's not low enough to make you ground out. So you'll, you'll make decent contact. When he throws it up in the zone, it's not high enough for you to either swing and miss or to pop it up. So when he throws the fastball, it's kind of in the middle of the zone when he misses with it. So uh, be patient. He's going to give you pitches to hit. The thing that's, that's tough is he can go, he can throw really deep. He can go really long. He has seven outings this year. And, He's only been a starter for half the season. He has seven outings this year of more than 100 pitches. Uh, one of them, he went 118 pitches against South Carolina in April. Seven and two-thirds, one run, and an Ole Miss victory. So he's going to go deep. Yeah. But when Auburn played them in, in game one of that series, he went three to third against Auburn. Six hits, two runs, one walk, five strikeouts. Auburn stretched him into 60-something pitches to get seven outs. So if you do something like that, you're looking at him going maybe five innings before he's hit that 100, 110 pitch right. limit and you're getting into that bullpen. And that's where Old Miss has had to pull guys from all season because they've had so many injuries. They've got um, they've got like a, a freshman back there that's, that's one of their closers right now. They're using young guys. So the sooner you can get Dylan DeLucia out of the game and get into that bullpen the sooner Auburn's going to be able to start putting up big numbers on the scoreboard is that is that what Auburn has to do to to win get, take, get him out of the game take pitches be patient pounce on his mistakes and then do damage once you get him out of the game and then when you get on base against Dylan DeLucia Auburn needs to be looking to run so Hayden Dunhurst catcher uh, very good catcher I was very impressed with his his game calling and his pitch framing when yep. he was in Auburn for those three games. 
Uh, good, good arm strength, but for some reason, he cannot translate that into games. He's caught 10 of 38 base dealers this year. By contrast, I think we're a bit spoiled by Nate LaRue, how Nate LaRue is 65, 70%, and his arm is a weapon in the game. Most catchers, the, like the MLB average this season is like 32% caught stealing. Uh huh. And Dunhurst is like below that. Um, but Auburn has a chance if they can get on base to get guys in motion. I'm thinking of Blake Rambush. I'm thinking of Bobby Pierce. I think Cole right. Foster has more wheels than we give him credit for. Yeah. Auburn's got some guys that can steal. So be patient against Dylan DeLucia, hit the bad pitches, and then move runners from station to station so that base hits can bring them in. You can't rely on the long ball in Omaha. It's a giant ballpark. But you can hit him in the gaps. You can make him run after him. And if you have moved a guy from first to second on a steal, he's going to score on a base hit. You're predicting Auburn to beat Ole Miss? I'm predicting Auburn to beat Ole Miss. When I did the locked on uh, College World Series preview with Chris Gordy, our friend from Locked On SEC. Right. I actually had the end of bracket two, such great names to these, the end of bracket two being Arkansas and Auburn and um, Arkansas getting the victory over Auburn to go to the College World Series championship where they were going to face Texas. That was my prediction. That's been the most popular pick, right? Texas or Arkansas winning the whole thing. I've seen so many predictions, and it's Texas versus Arkansas in the final. Texas versus, versus Arkansas That's in the final. Cool. Yeah. And um, Makes sense. But there's a path here for all eight teams, and all eight teams can do it. And I think Auburn has the tools and, more importantly, the mindset to make a run and go deep in this tournament. Yeah, the, the, the path, though, closes if Auburn does not win tomorrow, in my mind. Yeah, you have to win game one. And it's simply – it's the same format as regionals. If you If you win game one and two – you're virtually guaranteed to make it to that, you know, to, to the a chance to win the, the bracket. Right. But if you start off in the loser's bracket, every single game you play from that point on is an elimination game. And yep. that just ratchets the stress up to 11. So you got to come out strong. I feel good about their odds against Ole Miss as long as you don't um, leave a giant hanging pitch to Tim Elko for him to crush 400 feet. Uh, has, has a school record 22 home runs this year playing yeah. first base there for Ole, uh, for Ole Miss. But outside of that, I feel good about uh, facing an Ole Miss team that has the highest ERA of all eight teams in Omaha. Lindsay, how can people find you, hear you, read you, all that stuff? Uh, I am on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My writing, which we've done tons of stuff this week, all about this, including the preview that's up today, AuburnDaily.com. And then my show, Locked on MLB Prospects, is available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. You can find it on Twitter at Locked on Farm, as well as the merch AUShirts.com. Support our boys. Absolutely. We'll be back on Monday to recap everything that happens over this crazy, crazy week. All right here on Locked On Auburn.